Hello, and welcome to the New York City chapter of the American Guild of Organists YouTube page. My name is James Wetzel, and I'm the chapter's sub-dean and your host. Today, we remember the late Dr. John Weaver, born April 27, 1937, died February 1st of 2021. A loving husband and father, devoted Presbyterian, respected composer, consummate performer, insightful teacher, and of course, train aficionado, John is principally remembered for his decades-long tenure at three institutions, the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia, and the Juilliard School and the Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church of New York City. With us today are three of John's students who, now in the stride of their own careers, have taken up John's mantle as his immediate successor at these august organizations. Alan Morrison at Curtis, Paul Jacobs at Juilliard, and Andrew Henderson at Madison Avenue Presbyterian. We will remember John, this great man, and discuss how his influence continues to be felt in the organ world of today. Alan, Paul, and Andrew, welcome. What it was like to study with John Weaver as was just a wonderful experience, I know for all of us. The, one of the first things that comes to mind, aside from the music making and musical instruction, was his character. And he just had a great moral character. He um, embodied that, he lived that, and he fed it to his students as well. He never, I never heard him say an unkind word um, about any colleagues. And just, it was sort of understood that we would not do the, that either, uh, that we would just keep our thoughts to ourselves and um, keep our blinders on and not focus on other people and to, you know, just do what we do. Um, inside lessons, um, I think one thing that sticks out the most is his insistence on, if you can call it perfection. Uh, there is no such thing really, but he wanted us to be our very best um, from a technical standpoint and musical standpoint. Um, he was a stickler for rhythm and most of all creative registrations and really taught us to use an instrument with our ears and not to pay so much attention to the names of the stops on the organ and just told us that it was our job, no matter where we went, to play a recital or to play a service or whatever we were doing, that we were to make whatever instrument we were playing sound its very best so that it would be in service of the music always. It wasn't about us and it wasn't trying to make the organ sound like something that it wasn't. And I always respected that greatly. And I think that's one thing that all of his students carry um, with them when they go around to various instruments. Thank you. Paul, would you share a few memories from your time studying with John? Certainly. I second everything Alan said. That was my experience as well in terms of his personality, his character. I first heard the name John Weaver from my high school teacher in Washington, Pennsylvania, when we were considering um, schools for me. Uh, the teacher obviously being uh, the most important consideration, I think, for any uh, young musician. He said, I've never heard anything negative about John Weaver, never a bad word. And um, I auditioned at Curtis. Uh, he struck me as a little bit intimidating, I recall, during that audition, given his, his height and just his very thick, sturdy features. Uh, but he was very gracious, a gentleman, and I think did his best to put me at ease, and I'm sure he did this with everyone. Uh, of course, studying with him, um, everything that Alan said is, is absolutely true. He was a, a very practical man in his lessons. Uh, he wanted students to, um, to communicate the music to a general audience, maybe to people who weren't organists, and come to appreciate and love the music that he was playing and he prepared and he wanted his students to do the same. And uh, he was, a, I would say, a very flexible man, a very versatile man in his interpretations. Um, he made no bones about preferring electric action to mechanical action. Um, 
I think, but yet he never faulted or turned his nose up at people who thought or felt differently than he. And I think that tolerance with him was something that I uh, take very seriously today. I mean, truly an open mind to different approaches. I think this is what he encouraged in his departments. Um, it's something that I encourage with my own students at Juilliard, uh, namely that the students benefit from one another as well. It's not just the teacher says, do this, and you imitate everything the teacher does, but you, um, you give some guide rails. Some students need more guidance than others, obviously, but some have very clear visions of what they want. And I think with John Weaver, he was recognized where a student was and in some cases just stepped away and provided uh, encouragement. But Alan's right, he was also a, a stickler for precision, articulation, uh, accuracy. Uh, they were, they were sloppy performances he didn't have a lot of patience for. And so we always felt that we were uh, very much on our toes in lessons around him. Um, but I think his, <clears throat> as a teacher today, I appreciate his uh, sort of generalist attitude to music making. It, it approaches music um, with an open mind and heart. Uh, you have to be very dedicated to, to reach a high level of music making, as I think he was. Um, but yet uh, he was alive at a time that the American organ scene, I would say, was and like like probably in Europe too, dealing with the uh, organ reform movement, which did some very good and important things, but maybe perhaps in some ways became a bit doctrinaire, overly dogmatic, and he he said as much. And he just charted his own independent path. He believed in what he was doing and um, didn't uh, allow, I think, others to... Um, uh, affect him in a, in a bullying kind of way. And uh, I appreciated that. And I think that that's, that's part of the legacy that he has left to us today. I think we're dealing with young organists who are more open-minded than perhaps some students might have been decades ago that are very open to uh, different approaches. And I think that's largely thanks uh, to him. And the last thing I'll say in terms of... Um, uh, just a, a legacy is that I think, unbeknownst to him, maybe he helped to um, sort of define an American style of playing. He was very proud of, uh, I think, American organ builders, uh, American virtuoso organists. He was a composer, you know, all of these sorts of things. Um, I think um, he helped to shape all of that and give the American organ scene, a, a sense of pride in its work and development in history. Certainly. So, so one, one of the things that, for which it always amazed me about John is that he taught not only at one great institution, Curtis, but at another Juilliard as well, which is how he came to influence so many, so many organ students over the years. Paul and Alan, you both studied with him at Curtis, Andrew, you studied with him at Juilliard. I, in addition to hearing your general reflections, I wonder if we could try to compare how it was studying with him later in your education than Alan and Paul who encountered him as an undergrad. Well, thank you, James, and thank you for bringing us all together to remember John. Um, I first met John Weaver at my audition at the Juilliard School, and of course, knew of his reputation um, and his excellent reputation, really. Uh, long before that. Um, I very much enjoyed studying with him, and I have to say I can certainly echo everything Paul and Alan have said. Um, certainly a judge of, you know, a judge of character um, is so important in a person, and he had sort of impeccable character and taste, uh, and I think that he really um, it very much imparted that on his students in a very subliminal way. He never came out and said, you must do this or must do that, but you simply just, his, the way he held himself and the way he, the way he sort of handled himself was very sort of catching. Um, I studied with him as a doctoral student, so perhaps my experience might be a little different. Um, I'd already had a number of years of organ study uh, from different uh, 
people. And uh, he was, I wouldn't say hands off, but he was very sort of careful to sort of allow a student sort of chart their course. And he was there to sort of help you with that. Um, he certainly, if you engaged him, and sometimes I would engage him in discussions and lessons and talk to him about different things, uh, you could get you know a sense of, oh, I like doing it this way because of, but he certainly wouldn't impose it. He wouldn't come to the table saying, this is the way to do it, or, either, or this is the best way to do it. He just would sort of take it in. And then if he felt he had to offer it, then he would. Uh, but otherwise, he really let each individual student um, really do their thing. So we know that John studied under Alexander McCurdy and Robert Baker. So your students would consider themselves the great grandchildren of, of that legacy, tracing it through McCurdy and Baker, through John, through you all, down to your students. Um, Alan, what sort of um, teaching legacy do you think carries on at Curtis, which is, as I hope most people know, uh, a very exclusive, small um, institute in Philadelphia. How do, you think, how do you think his teaching lives on through you? Well, I try to model that um, the, the character aspect um, of just being very professional, being very kind and caring to my students, and not to um, you know, be too harsh um, in criticism, but the way I always felt with him, I, I was always very intimidated by him just because of his presence and his, um, you know, I always thought he was just so, you know, perfect in so many ways. And I never wanted to disappoint him. So I try to approach my um, expectations uh, to my students so that they don't want to disappoint me. Uh, there are a lot of traditions that continue at Curtis, um, such as, you know, being well-dressed uh, for lessons in Oregon class because he always felt that we gave uh, more importance to what we were doing if we ourselves were put together properly. And I still believe that's very true. Um, and we still, you know, have a memory requirement of that can't go away. Um, it's not for everybody, uh, certainly, but it's, it's not something that we do away with at Curtis specifically. So that's, that's still very much in place. And I did study with him also at Juilliard. So it was interesting for me to see the um, comparison of how he was um, when I was younger, you know, as a freshman in college. And I, I had stayed at Curtis for my master's in piano accompanying. So I was away from Oregon and um, John Weaver for a few years. And then I took another year off after that and then went back to Juilliard to start a doctorate, which I just had too many um, opportunities that year that Weaver encouraged me to leave. And he said, you can always come back. You can always come back, but you're not going to get these opportunities. Um, by the time I got to Juilliard, I found him more grandfatherly. I wasn't, I don't know if it was me or if it was, um, you know, John, but I just felt he was much warmer and we had more dialogue and lessons um, about various things, not always music, um, just kind of life in general. But I saw how he was with the other students in organ class and it was very much the same. You know, he expected um, things to be just so uh, from the other students and he carried himself the same there as he did at Curtis. There was no no difference in institutions, so, um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Paul, for, for someone who came to Juilliard and actually overlapped with, with John for a year can, and then inherited the studio and have been there now for over 15 years, can you comment on what it was like to be there with your teacher and work alongside him and then eventually go to carry on? Well, sure. Um, actually, I, I'm approaching my 19th year at Juilliard now, if you can believe that. Um, <clears throat> but As your early students, I cannot believe that. Yes, it's coming up on Terrifying. year 19. Hard to believe. Uh, I, again, I echo everything that Alan said in terms of um, 
carrying on uh, core traditions that were established by John Weaver, um, even just the structure of um, the weekly performance class, everyone playing, uh, memorization is certainly something that is encouraged, but I agree with Alan, it's not for everyone. And um, I suppose what I observed was, as Alan used the word grandfatherly, I, I concur, uh, he was a, a bit older, approaching retirement by that point. I remember going into an organ class um, my first year, he was wearing a jacket that had an Amtrak pin on it. And of course, we all know of his love of trains. So I, I wasn't sure if he went to the Goodwill and picked that out and just forgot to take off the pin or what. But no, he was very proud of his trains and his pin. And uh, I think he was enjoying more train rides at that point in his life. So he was um, a little bit, um, I don't want to say more relaxed, but um, that it's inevitable that that happens, I guess. That's what we witness with teachers as they, they get a little bit older. But also, um, Juilliard, maybe because it, it has older students then. I mean, I hear what Andrew was saying, and Alan, as, as a doctorate, doctoral student for that year, um, you, you do treat older students probably a little bit differently um, just because they're older and have more perspective. They have different needs, a different perspective themselves. And I suspect that that um, was very apparent to him. But uh, he was always, John Weaver, always a consummate gentleman and, and just a very good human being. Alan and Paul, did John ever articulate a difference in approach that he wanted to apply to Juilliard versus Curtis? Not necessarily one of favoritism, but just one of uh, the kind of student he wanted to attract or thought would benefit from an education at Curtis or Juilliard. I never heard him articulate it or speak about it, but I think, you know, Curtis is such a different um, animal than most schools. Um, and it's a much, you know, it's such a small department that I think he felt some students would benefit better from a more protected environment um, and nurtured environment. And he thought other people might flourish better at Juilliard where you, there was more you know, going on and with dance and drama, you know, a, a much larger school. And I think he kind of knew um, who would do better where, because a lot of students ended up auditioning at both places, um, obviously. And, but his, from what I witnessed as a student at, at both institutions, he was the same in his approach to organ class and in his teaching, you know, just as I said, he just was a little, um, to me personally, it felt a warmer, friendlier relationship later. I, again, I completely agree with Alan. Um, you know, he was um, very consistent in how he treated people. Uh, he was consistent with, uh, not just in terms of institutions, but I, I think you could carry that on to um, um, just different, different positions in life. I, I remember seeing him carry on a conversation with the, you know, the custodians at the school and I, he treated them with the same degree of respect and, and uh, dignity that he would, uh, I guess, the people that uh, make a lot of money doing what they do. I mean, he, he was just that kind of human being and there, were, there was really no pretense to him. I mean, he was formal, yes, I think, you know, he, he believed in decorum but he wasn't a pretentious man at all. Um, he was very approachable and very kind. And he was this way with everybody throughout, throughout I think, everyone's experiences that I've ever heard. And it's always fun. And Andrew, I'm sure, will have some, some more to say on this, perhaps. But I've met uh, people who sang in the choir at Madison, Madison Avenue. And you know, everybody just loved, loved him, frankly. Well, just to share one little anecdote to buttress that, I remember first being introduced to John at the 2002 AGO National in Philadelphia. And after the opening ceremony, I um, had gone up and introduced myself as a middle school student. And in a flood of important 
nationally renowned organist with whom he could have taken time to speak. We actually walked back to the convention hotel together. He, myself and my mom, and treated me as if everything that was coming out of my very little arrogant mouth was the most important and cherished thing that he could do with his time. And that memory always just struck me as exactly the sort of teacher with whom I wanted to study and ended up did studying with, with his student, Paul and Julia. So Andrew, moving on to the other pillar of John's life, we have education on one side, and then we have church music on the other. Certainly he is still remembered as, through his compositions and the work that he did at Madison Avenue. Um, what was it like as his student to, uh, to know that firsthand and to see it and then have the privilege of carrying it on? Yes, well, he really was a major uh, cornerstone of Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church for 35 years. And as you mentioned, he was the emeritus director of music um, until the end, the end of his life. And so he was extremely beloved here. Um, he was a wonderful pastoral musician. Um, as you said, he treated every, everyone uh, the same. And he, you really see that he sort of cared about everyone in the church. Um, and he also was an extremely, I guess, relational person. Uh, he was formal, but he was certainly very relational. He worked very, very closely with the pastoral staff. Uh, and the sort of the way the liturgy is found here, um, there's an awful lot that goes into the integration of theology and music. Uh, and there's a long history of that. And he was a perfect fit for that. He was someone who took great care to be sure that liturgies are well formed uh, and that the music really served in the course of the liturgy. There was no sense of showmanship. Um, I was reminded recently about um, the fact that he really, really disliked applause in services, particularly after a postlude, because that was not the reason for the postlude. It was to glorify God, and it was not to be any kind of sort of tag on performance. Uh, and so that just, you can see that in other parts of his life. And you mentioned compositions. Um, so many uh, pieces were written for the liturgy here, choral pieces, pieces of service music, and certainly organ music uh, of his, uh, and pieces also for organ and flute that he and Marianne would play um, were frequently performed here. So there was a great integration of Weaver and MAPC. Um, I, in denominationally, he was very active with the Presbyterian Association of Musicians, was the president of that, and was very instrumental in the 1990 Presbyterian hymnal. And in many ways, uh, you might almost consider that hymnal sort of an MAPC hymnal. There are so many things about it that relate to what is done liturgically here at MAPC. Uh, so I think that he was just such an integral part of this congregation, so much beloved uh, and very much missed. Uh, beyond the hymnal, I, I know that your choral library there is full of works that he either wrote specifically for that or wrote for other places that, it, that are still sung there. Are there some perennials that you would recommend to an audience listening here that might otherwise be unfamiliar? Oh, goodness. Well, there's actually a very good recording um, from 2005. One of the sort of retirement projects that the church put together um, was a recording of a number of his choral pieces uh, and a few organ works as well. Um, that's on the JAV label. Um, and so there are some great pieces there. In fact, a lot of them I got to know from that recording. I sort of walked into the position. I didn't know a lot of the pieces. Uh, and I very slowly got to know the library very well. Um, there are a number of pieces I would recommend um, that also aren't published. And I'm hoping that we can get that changed at some point soon. Um, he was a very humble man. Um, I think maybe the word humble hasn't come up yet. And I think as a composer, he was extremely gifted, but he was also very humble. He wasn't out there kind of peddling his wares, so to speak. He really um, didn't try to push it onto people. Um, and I have to say, I mean, it's almost been embarrassing, but I went in for one of my interviews for the position and someone asked the question, well, what pieces of Weber do you play? And I thought, I don't actually play anything by John. And he, he never sort of pushed me to, and I had two years of study with him. And I sort of thought, I said, well, I don't play anything yet. And they said, well, okay. And of course, since then, I've learned a lot of, uh, a lot of organ works of his and, you know, and also had a chance to speak with him about that when he was here to visit. He often stayed in our apartment um, on his many train journeys. Uh, when he always required a stop 
to change at Penn Station, he would often would stay with us. And so we kept in very close contact. Um, so I would you know, try to pick his brain about his pieces, even if I didn't study with him uh, in the early days. Uh, just in the last aspect of this video, I thought maybe we would just have an open discussion and see where it goes from here instead of structured questions. Um, Paul, would, could we start with you maybe to share just a, a lighthearted anecdote and get an <laughs> insight into, into maybe the, the other side of John? Well, sure, there are always anecdotes. Um, I, I, I wish, I'm trying to think which one to share. Uh, we were talking a little before about the Ave Maria. Should I, should I share that story? I think that's, not, yes, please. <laughs> well, I have a friend um, in California who he is a Norbertine priest. And he also is a very musical man who studied at Oberlin, studied piano. Uh, but knows a little bit about organ music. And years ago, uh, John Weaver was performing in California and uh, my friend attended this recital. And on the program was John Weaver's version of um, Schubert's Ave Maria. After the program, my friend, again, who is a Norbertine priest, uh, was dressed in a black suit and Roman collar, went to uh, John Weaver to congratulate him on the beautiful program that also I think included uh, Franck's Grand Pierre Symphonique. And um, upon mentioning the Ave Maria, John said uh, uh, rather gruffly, well, I don't get into all of that Queen of Heaven stuff. And my friend said he was just left there staring blankly into the camera. He found that very amusing. So uh, John was a proud Presbyterian. We know that. Andrew knows that very well. <laughs> Andrew, are there any stories that still get told around Madison Avenue? Oh, I think there are lots of lots of stories. He loved model trains, uh, and that developed very much as a boy, I believe. And as he got older, he started purchasing um, more and more um, trains and track and buildings and would sort of assemble one, I think, around the Christmas tree every year. He decided he wanted to put a train set in his office which of course ended up taking over the entire office. And he and Marianne built platforms out of scrap wood they found and they sort of put a paper mache mountain against the fireplace and there was a trestle under which you had to go to get to his desk. And that all unfortunately had to leave uh, in order to clear the way for me to have an office. And the train was united with the train in Vermont. But I can remember a story um, when the church session, the governing body, um, and I think at that time, John was attending session meetings regularly and he, uh, there was an action or motion um, that John Weaver wanted to approach the session. And so he asked the session if he could build a train set in his office. And they sort of looked at each other and, well, Mr. Weaver, you'll have to leave the, uh, the room while we deliberate. And so John sort of sheepishly walked out and walked out of the room and the door closed and it was met with complete peals of laughter. The room completely dissolved. And, so, and someone came to the door and said, Mr. Weaver, you can come back in. We can give you permission to build a train set in your office. And so therefore the train was officially noted in the session minutes and um, it was built over a period of probably a couple of years, I'm sure. Um, and there's actually, I don't remember this YouTube um, link online of, of John giving a, a tour um, of his uh, train set that was in the office and eventually made its way to Vermont. If it still exists, we'll put it in the, bot in the description of this video so that you can all watch it at home. Alan, anything come to mind, maybe from his commuting days down to Philadelphia on that train? Oh, well, yeah, well, something that happened on the train, of course, he was on the train with some other professors at Curtis from New York, because we, a lot of the faculty is in New York City. And he was rather embarrassed when he got to um, Curtis, and he kind of had a mess on his suit. And he said that he had started to crack open his hard boiled egg that Marianne had fixed on the train and it wasn't a hard boiled egg and it ended up all over <laughs> his lap and he was in a mess. So I remember that train story. He was very embarrassed. Was that, was that April the 1st, Alan, by chance? I don't know. Was that, Marianne that having really fun good. with her husband, do you think? <laughs> 
And another, um, Paul had mentioned his Amtrak pin on, for his lapel on his suit jacket. Uh, he also wrote letters on Amtrak stationery, and I have several of those letters uh, that he wrote to me. And um, one of those letters, um, go on a more serious topic, going back to his um, being a man of character, um, was sort of a, you know, now you've graduated and I just, you know, wish you well. And he was giving me a, a bunch of pointers that he, um, you know, just wanted to pass along. And one of those being on this Amtrak stationery, saying never to get in, uh, involved, do not ever partake in any petty arguments which seem to dominate the profession, uh, to stay away from it and be above it all. And I had always remembered that. Um, and I was just going through some letters during the pandemic, um, organizing all of my um, messy file cabinets. And I came across that letter and that's where it was. So I'm really happy to have that in his writing um, on Amtrak stationery. Uh, is there, speaking of handwritten notes, whenever I work through a score that I studied in undergrad, I'm always amused to see, Paul, your very neat cursive uh, throughout, especially in the Franck editions. Uh, is there a particular piece either that you can't play without, uh, without thinking of John or with which you predominantly associate uh, with, with his performances? That, that'll go to all three of you. Yeah, I, um, it's not a piece I associate with um, John. I'm not sure I ever heard him play it, the Durofle Suite. Uh, but I had learned it after um, well, I guess my, you know, during school, but I had put it away and brought it out for a competition after I had been away from him for about three years. And I asked him if he would be willing to listen to my program um, just to make sure I wasn't doing anything horrible or didn't memorize anything out of order. And so I, he walked in to my church in Philadelphia, First Baptist, at that point, and I handed him the score, and I played the whole suite, and after it was over, um, he said, well, I think you're in good shape. He said, you'll, you'll find my markings in red. And so I come <laughs> through, I couldn't find anything, and there's one 16th rest in the Sicilian that he circled in his red felt tip pen. And I get to that point every time, and, I, and I'm sure there were many more things he could have circled. He didn't. Um, but I always think of, uh, I've never forgotten that rest since then. Paul, anything that leaps to mind for you? Uh, well, many things, of course, but I, I suppose I could cite uh, Franck's finale and B-flat major taking that into a lesson. And <clears throat> I was not convinced that it was a particularly uh, great effort on Franck's part as a student um, just kind of a showpiece at the end, very light. I didn't care for the themes much. And he corrected me. He said, well, I, gosh, I think this is a wonderful piece. And he said, scoot over. And he uh, sat down on the organ, set up a, a few pistons without warming up and launched into it from beginning to end. It was really electrifying. It was a riveting performance. Of course, it, it's not something that the purists would uh, approve of because he did take some liberties but uh, and, and the tempo, not least of which was was much quicker than we're used to hearing it. But it was thrilling, and once that was finished, the final B flat major chord, we looked at each other, and and I smiled, and he smiled, and I I understood that uh, it was a piece worth playing. Andrew, well, a number of pieces sort of spring to mind. Pieces by Bach. Um, I completed learning the Messian's Nativity with him, and he played that piece, loved it, and played it at Mamie PC on Christmas Eve uh, on occasion. Um, but I was just remembering, I believe he was learning it at exactly the same time. And you think about someone like John Weaver, he must know everything. But in fact, he had never learned officially um, the Fantasy and Fugue on um, How Brightly Shines the Morning Star of Rager. I, th I think this is right. And we actually learned it at the same time. I'd sort of had it in mind and heard it and thought, if I'm going to you know, spend time on a Rager piece, I think I'm going to spend time on this one. Um, and so we actually learned it about the same time. And so he was sort of sharing little tips about, oh, I do this with the few, and I think we could figure this out. And um, so it was kind of neat that actually we, we were looking at it at the same time, almost a bit daunting. Uh, but it was, uh, that, that's one that just happened to come to mind, just floating in my memory. 
but even an excellent tribute that a teacher was willing to admit that not only didn't he play something, but that he would go through it with the student. Mm -hmm. And gentlemen, I, I think maybe we have just time for a final comment if, if you like, otherwise we'll call it a day. Well, I think he'll certainly be remembered um, the way he deserves to be remembered by everyone in the profession. And that is with utmost respect and with a little smile. Yes, yes, I, I, I second that. Um, uh, we owe so much to him and uh, he is just uh, one of the finest, finest human beings uh, that I've ever known personally. And he set such a stellar example to us all as organists and we can be very proud of him. I guess I'll officially third the motion, agree with all of that. The, um, you know, certainly John, just thinking again as a pastoral musician, he was obviously an amazing musician and he brought great skills as an organist, hymn player, um, as a choral director, a liturgical planner, um, but was very much um, a man of God and was very, very humble um, and was extremely, extremely loved here at this church and certainly by all of the students uh, who had the privilege to work with him. I have one, I have a really funny story um, that I could close with. And I don't know if Andrew or Paul have similar stories um, in their positions. <clears throat> but as he was leaving, like Paul, um, he and I overlapped for one year at Curtis when he said, you know, I'll let you do your thing, but if you need any help, let me know. So at the end of that year, his final year, I played a faculty recital in his honor because he was receiving an honorary doctorate from Curtis. So there was commencement. It was a big weekend. And I think they had some alumni events going on. And I had, I was very, had been very nervous, you know, about the performance. So I made sure I was extra prepared and, you know, the all in a row were, you know, Gary Grafman, Eleanor Sokoloff, who was a staple at our school, Cherry Rhodes was in town, my piano teacher, Susan Starr, you know, and they were just all in a row. So I was already getting a little, um, some butterflies in my stomach. And we were backstage, uh, John was with me, and I got to be about three, uh, five minutes before three, which is when the performance was. And Mary Ann came back and said, John, come on, we've got to get our seats, leave Alan alone, he needs to concentrate. And he said, oh, okay. So he got up and he walked down the hallway and he got to the end and he turned around and looked at me and he said, gosh, I don't envy you this. <laughs> and walked. And then I had to go out and play. Uh. Well, on that uplifting and humorous <laughs> note, I'd like to thank Alan Morrison, Paul Jacobs, and Andrew Henderson for sharing their time with us today on behalf of the American Guild of Organists, New York City chapter, and all organists out there, uh, we owe so much to Dr. Weaver and to the three of you who are carrying on his name and his, his efforts. And to those of you watching, thank you for joining our YouTube page. We do have a number of other videos up. We've just completed a full season of Pipe Organs of New York, a background look at historic churches and their um, their organs here in New York. Dr. Weaver's own Madison Avenue Presbyterian has been featured in one of our most recent ones. And if you would like to learn more about the chapter, our works and our mission, please do find us uh, in the contact information below in the description and get in touch. And thank you very much again.